Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Damien Tambini. Dr. Tambini is a Distinguished Policy Fellow and Associate Professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics, where he also serves as Program Director for the Masters in Media and Communications. He is the author of many articles on media and communications regulation and policy, as well as the author and editor of several books. His most recent book is Media Freedom, published in 2021, which was described as essential reading by European Commissioner Jourova this summer. As an expert in media and communications regulation and policy, Dr. Tambini is frequently called to give evidence to parliamentary committees and provide formal and informal policy advice to governments and international organizations. So Damien, you know about our three plus one format. You get three questions and one soapbox moment at the end. Um, let me put the first question on screen. Um, it's a it's a broad one. You can write a thesis. You wrote a book actually <laughs> about it, but sadly we only have uh, maximum five minutes for them for this one. Mm -hmm. What does protecting media freedom mean to you? Well, as I argue in my book, there are two ways of thinking about media freedom, and there's a narrow one and a more positive, broader one. Uh, the narrow if you like, negative approach to media freedom says media freedom is about governments getting out of the way um, and you can achieve media freedom, for example, uh, by ensuring that there are uh, limits on government's ability to interfere with broadcasters, uh, by ensuring that uh, laws affecting the media, such as defamation and reputation rights, are not too um, uh, uh, enthusiastically pursued uh, by governments and those protecting their, their, their uh, reputations. Um, and broadly, in this negative rights view, um, it's all about getting governments out of the communication space. I argue, on the other hand, that particularly in our current environment, where the media are in something of a crisis uh, for revenue, for advertising revenue, um, and also for audiences uh, competing with um, services uh, and uh, producers that are uh, look like the media but are not in fact uh, ethical, truth-seeking, democracy-serving organizations. Uh, in this new environment, you need a more positive approach to media freedom, not only about getting governments out of the communication space, but in terms of providing positive supports for the media. So uh, in this next phase of, of democracy, I think um, media free, protecting media freedom is really the same thing as protecting democracy. It's much more important than it has been uh, for a very long time to protect uh, media freedom because uh, the attacks on media freedom uh, are really part of a global assault on democracy. And in order to protect media freedom more adequately, we need a more positive approach. We need not only for governments to get out of the way, but for governments and the European Union coordinating those governments to be much more proactive in engaging with the media, providing the supports that the media uh, need in order, as I say, to protect democratic communication. Okay, so basically it, it, it needs to be more ambitious than just making sure that there's no capture of media by government. And it needs to be about sustainability um, uh, of, of media that uh, serves democracy by informing and, and by acting as a, a, a watchdog often. Um, We'll see if, if that ambition is reflected, obviously, uh, once the European Media Freedom Act uh, comes out. But I think let's try to think about how to shape that ambition um, and, and look at our second question. What should the EU legislators do or do better to protect media freedom? Well, in order to answer that question, Caroline, we have to understand that the European Union, the European Commission can't do anything. Um, and I think that there are two drivers to this process in a way. There is 
Uh, on one hand, the kind of principled protections of, for democracy that I spoke about before, uh, the political will for new legislation, as we saw in the Democracy Action Plan, is all about protecting democracy, um, dealing with those threats to of, of media capture that, that we've discussed. But there's another side to it, which is um, that the way, uh, particularly in post-authoritarian countries, media systems are regulated or fail to be regulated is creating a lot of fragmentation within the European Union and within the European single market. So on the one hand, we have uh, the political will and enthusiasm to uh, protect media freedom, which is supported by civil society organizations, which is uh, broadly, I would say the majority opinion within the European Union that something urgently needs to be done from the point of view of democracy. But there's also an awareness that the European uh, single market is increasingly threatened on the one hand by uh, the um, uh, existing legislative framework being fragmented. Um, by a lack of regulatory cooperation between regulators um, and uh, that this is impacting on levels of mergers and acquisitions. It's impacting on uh, levels of investment in the media sector um, and particularly uh, cross-border economic uh, development. So there is an economic cost to a problem of media freedom. There's also a, a, a democratic cost and it's the economic cost and the economic problems which really provide the European Union with the competence and the legal support for developing a new, new European Freedom Act. It's Article 114 of the Treaty of the Functioning on, uh, of the European Union, which provides the competence. And that's very important when we think about what EU legislators should do, because they can only act within the uh, scope of competence uh, which they have. But it does, uh, in my view, open up uh, a number of uh, possible avenues to develop what I described as a, a as a uh, a more positive approach. And one area, for example, is enforcing much more transparency, both in terms of things like media ownership. And there's a Council of Europe recommendation from 2018, which says that uh, Council of Europe member states should do a lot more to ensure that citizens know uh, who owns the media that they uh, are consuming, um, but also transparency of, for example, allocation of state resources, including state advertising. So there are a number of uh, much more proactive, much more positive measures that could be um, implemented um, as well, for example, in terms of how uh, public service media are regulated uh, and um, uh, monitored. And that's been a, a particular uh, state advertising and, and regulation of public service media, independence of public service media have been revealed to be key problems, um, not only in terms of the democratic implications of a lack of media freedom, but in terms of those crucial impacts on the single market. Um, they create uncertainty, they uh, diminish investment, and uh, that's why a leadership role for the European Union is justified because um, you know the question you've 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 put is, is is a really interesting one because it begs the question what's the balance between what EU legislators should do and member states should do and traditionally these sensitive issues as regards cultural policy and uh, anything which has to do with democratic legitimacy have been a, a difficult issue of subsidiarity so I think uh, in the next period, there's this um, subtle uh, and important balance between a leadership and harmonizing role for the European Union and also uh, political um, implementation and support by member states. So it's it's difficult and it's sensitive, but I think the, the EU legislators should take a leadership role. And I think we need some form of 
uh, either a soft law instrument to assist with the necessary harmonization um, uh, and also some kind of legislative instrument to um, support uh, things like enhanced uh, regulatory cooperation between independent uh, regulatory authorities, which also uh, need enhanced protection of their independence. Um, this has been a constant theme for, for recent years. Um, the independence of regulatory authorities and the independence of, of uh, public public broadcasters or state stroke public broadcasters has been threatened uh, in, in certain European countries. And the um, European uh, standards of independence really need to be uh, better uh, protected. So I hear independence, uh, both of public service media and of the regulators. I hear um, ambitious harmonizations within <laughs> what the European Commission and the European Union can do. Um, also, um, funding that is done the right way uh, and uh, obviously transparency, both of ownership and that funding. Um, so those are all, I would say, the the positive messages in terms of what can be done. Um, let's switch to our next question. Um, you know, legislators can do good, but sometimes legislators also generate some collateral damage in trying to do good. So what are the pitfalls that EU legislators should avoid when trying to protect the media and our freedoms? I think the most important thing, and, and the, the book which you mentioned at the beginning, um, is a really historical book. It looks at the development of media freedom over centuries. Um, and what I learned researching the book was that uh, on one hand, the media themselves are an important part of uh, battling for media freedom, uh, establishing autonomy from the state. Uh, if you think back to the press and broadcasting centuries, uh, and I think we need to think about how this uh, cycle of reforms need to take the media uh, with um, uh, public authorities and with, with the Commission, um, that, so the, 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 the support of the media is important. Um, but more fundamentally, the trust and support of citizens is important. We're, we're living in an age of distrust, and a lot of that distrust is manifest in uh, a lot of uh, conspiracies about where certain messages come from um, and fundamental to that is an idea of uh, who the media ultimately are working for and I think what citizens need to really understand and respect is uh, an idea that the media are working for them um, and that uh, they have the public interest and they have the interest in truth um, uh, at heart. Um, so it's really important that um, there is a very open and public process uh, with the uh, development of new legislation. There are going to be challenges from particular member states who've established control over media sectors and those challenges will take the form of um, attempts to say that this is a an attack on media freedom by the Commission or an attempt to control European Commission by the media. So um, I think um, the, the Commission need to be very, very clear about the limits of what they do. They need to go gently. They need to take the media with them and they need, uh, with the help of those media, to take citizens uh, with them. Um, and everything should flow from that and an assessment that um, uh, this could all um, make the challenges to the European Union. We've got, you know, in Italy um, and in Eastern Europe and in France, uh, waiting on the wings, some profoundly um, anti-European uh, populist um, political movements uh, taking um, a position and what we don't want is a gift to those uh, th th those movements that will feed the conspiracies. So uh, my hope is that th this whole cycle can really support the media and the media are in a weak position because of these uh, revenue difficulties they've had. Mm -hmm. um, 
the Commission needs to strengthen the media economically. That includes through uh, coordinating through the Digital Services Act, new approaches to competition, which will correct the power imbalance between the platforms and the media. Um, they need to ensure that uh, independent media are sustainable and that there is a clear distinction um, in the policy framework and also in people's minds about the difference between state media and public media. So this is really an opportunity for renewal in uh, uh, democratic systems. I think my personally, and if you look back to the democracy action plan of the European Commission, I think at the policy level, there's a lot of understanding of the importance of uh, these reforms of media regulation to wider protections of democracy and that this, this is a very serious moment for democracy in Europe and at the centre of the Commission's response is this Media Freedom Act. Um, so it's structural and it's systemic, it enables the media to be sustainable and to pay for those very expensive things like news which people trust and which people trust rightly because it's independent and it seeks the truth so basically um we're talking about rekindling the relationship between um readers and uh media and also getting buy-in from media and users in the media freedom act and explaining why it's important why it matters and why they should support it um, knowing that, as you mentioned, um, you know, media has not the same degree of independence in all EU member states. Um, we won't mention which ones. I think they know who they are, <laughs> um, which is which is obviously quite a challenge. Uh, and, and I'm sure, um, as you mentioned, that some uh, member states might not play that game as, as nicely as others. Um, we're reaching the end of the po podcast, which is that moment where I put two um, strong ladies of Brussels on screen, uh, the soapbox moment. Um, you have two minutes, approximately, to deliver your recommendations, your thoughts, uh, you know, your the results of your analysis from writing the Media Freedom book to... Uh, the ladies that rule in Brussels, uh, Ursula von der Leyen from the European Commission and Roberta Metzola from the European Parliament. I would say that it's important to bring citizens with you um, and always remember that. And it's the citizens that need to trust the media. So uh, it's entirely necessary that you think creatively about how to support the revenue model of trustworthy, independent news, and that those supports for the media are independent from uh, you, uh, from member state control, uh, and that they are understood to be independent. So uh, very often uh, there's a lot of um, support for media literacy, but I think we need to think about that in a more radical way, to think about Pub, wider public understanding of who the media are working for. So, you know, there is a policy shopping list, if you like. We do need to think about um, how to um, s more adequately support the revenue model of commercial uh, trustworthy news. And that means some of the reforms within the Digital Markets Act, um, mm -hmm. thinking carefully about uh, whether specific competition rules are necessary um, for the media sector in order to redress uh, the balance for uh, media which serve the public interest. We need to uh, much more adequately support uh, media ownership, transparency and independence and the independence of public service media. Uh, I'd like to see um, more uh, European monitoring through the centers um, uh, in uh, Germany and in uh, in Florence of media ownership. Uh, I do understand that it's that it's difficult for the Commission to be um, 
uh, in negotiations with certain member states about the state of media freedom. But what we can do is, is support independent monitoring of media freedom much more, more adequately. So broadly, remember that this is about trust of the media uh, by citizens, ultimately, um, and work with the media to ensure that that is fostered in this next uh, policy cycle. But all power to you both. Thank you, Dr. Tambini. Um, let, let's hope that someone from their cabinet listens into the podcast once we publish it. Um, a lot of challenges, um, a conversation that is just starting. Um, I'm sure that there will be follow ups and I hope we will have the, the, the pleasure and the honor of having your take uh, on those. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. Thank you.